Hey, we are apparently live, and um, we have some fairly substantial competition. Um, would somebody mind closing those, that door back there? Um, oh, I didn't mean for you, Marshall, but thank you anyway. Um, uh, Marshall's a can-do kind of guy. <laughs> um, we have a lot of competition in terms of other panels, but I'm glad that we got um, semi-decent numbers, and maybe we can have a nice conversation. So I'm Tom Davenport, I'm the moderator for this gathering, and um, I'm a professor mostly at Babson. I have a couple of minor MIT credentials, is maybe why I appear at all of these um, CIO, CDO, whatever events, but I'm also a visiting professor at Oxford. Um, it turns out this is a bad time to be a visiting professor. There's nobody there to visit. Um, and I um, am a senior advisor to Deloitte's AI practice. And so um, this event is about AI and ecosystems, and so we made sure that everybody here has a perspective on this set of issues. Um, and Michael Schrade, who is the moderator for the panel next door, has agreed to join us. Oh, uh, okay. Oh, I didn't realize that. I thought, I thought you were moderating over there. That's so why I was kidding you about switching. Um, um, so uh, we have three great panelists, and I will let them introduce themselves in order. Michelle, you want to get started? Right, uh, Michelle Hoyseth, um, Chief Data Officer at Paracel International. Um, Paracel is a clinical development uh, organization, uh, so a life sciences company. Uh, we develop uh, biotechnology and pharmaceuticals, medical devices from first in man through life cycle management, reimbursement, uh, market access. Marshall Van Alstein. Uh, we wrote one of the first books on platform business models. So I'm happy to field any questions on platforms and ecosystems and how they're using AI and machine learning and how they're using it to stump the competition. So happy to, happy to see you. Also a professor. One of the downsides of having two professors is you get two <laughs> presentations, but uh, whatever. <laughs> I'm not a professor. Uh, Although you could play one on television. Uh, yes, I could. <laughs> uh, Vipin Gopal, um, I'm the chief data and analytics officer at uh, Eli Lilly and Company. Uh, Eli Lilly is a global uh, pharmaceutical company with, uh, that has been around for 140 plus years. Uh, my role at the company is to lead the overall data strategy across the enterprise and also to develop and apply uh, advanced analytics, AI, across the pharma value chain. So I think Vipin and I are supposed to keep you two grounded, is that? Yeah, uh, yes. uh, <laughs> in so occasionally we inject a note of practicality into the <laughs> proceedings. Make sure it's real and applied. <laughs> yeah. um, okay, so I'm going to give you a very short presentation and then Marshall promises also a short presentation on this topic, which is a kind of, esoteric topic, so we thought a little introduction might be useful. Um, uh, AI and ecosystems and platforms don't necessarily come to mind. You know, one doesn't uh, summon the other necessarily, but so by ecosystems, we just mean the sort of sum total of the business relationships that an organization has. Typically, it's suppliers, customers, partners, could be some other things as well. Um, and there, uh, I'll let Marshall go into greater detail on this because he's certainly done more work on platforms than I have, but platforms are a specific kind of ecosystem-oriented business model in which software, one of the confusing things is people often refer to that software as a platform as well, um, facilitates and kind of eases the friction of these transactional relationships among multiple ecosystem participants. Probably a lot of you know this already, and so um, why do we think about AI in this regard? I would argue you can't really do, you can do an ecosystem without AI, but you can't really do a platform very effectively. One of the things it does is it matches buyers and sellers of services. You know, when I called an Uber to bring me here from my hotel this morning, AI figured out you know, which driver would be well suited to, to pick me up. Um, 
Typically, uh, the particular brand of AI that's used most commonly in these is machine learning, which can be used to improve the services offered to participants, to you know, decide where drivers ought to hang out in Uber in order to minimize the, the pickup times. Um, but there are other forms of AI. I mean, the, if these platforms work out, they accumulate customers quite rapidly or participants quite rapidly. And um, you may have noticed that if you have a problem with Uber, it's not that easy to kind of call up a customer service line and say, help. Um, so all, you, all these companies try to do that with a, various forms of AI, including natural language processing and, and so on. Um, and then AI can just be used as sort of previous generations of analytics were to optimize some of the logistical processes involved. Um, there is this virtuous circle idea, which I thought I invented, but then when I was talking to Marshall, he mentioned it as well, so I guess that I didn't, um, of kind of AI in these systems um, where you know companies have a certain set of customers and then they start using AI and they capture more data from those customers. As one of the companies I'm gonna talk about in a second said, it's like a Disneyland of data in this environment. Um, that lets you improve your AI models. Um, that lets you improve your services with AI, you know, the, the matching and other related services. That further reduces customer friction, which is one of the things you're supposed to be doing in these models, and that tells everybody, gee, this is a great service. Um, why don't you sign up for it? And you acquire more customers, which gives you more data, et cetera, et cetera. So really, uh, when it works well, it's quite impressive. Now, some of these companies you're extremely familiar with. Most platform companies are digital native firms. Uh, I've already mentioned Uber, Lyft is similar. Airbnb, of course, a famous platform. Google, probably one of the earliest. Facebook and Meta have some. Amazon has some, particularly in the markets business, and, and eBay, of course. But there are also a number of legacy companies that have said, we like this business model as well. It tends to have the highest valuations of any type of business model. My friend Barry Liebert has done some good research in that regard. Uh, Ping An, I'll say more about in a second. Airbus, uh, you may not be familiar with this um, ecosystem called Skywise, which is a kind of a consortium, it's really a joint venture with Palantir, the semi-mysterious um, data integration and management company. And Skywise uses Palantir to collect all of the data from every airline in the world that has Airbus um, airplanes. And they try to do things with AI like predictive maintenance, um, optimizing fuel consumption, optimizing route structures, et cetera. Sampo is a Japanese company. Um, I think the second largest insurance company and the largest nursing home company in Japan. Nursing homes are a big business in Japan for obvious demographic reasons. Anyway, um, Sampo is creating five different ecosystems. Um, uh, Ping An also has five different ecosystems. They are also a joint venture partner with Palantir. Um, in fact, they own half of Palantir in Japan. Palantir is not necessary to do this work. I, I'm not trying to publicize them, but um, data integration is a helpful capability. Anthem is the second largest health insurance company in the United States, and if you have them as your health insurance provider, they own a number of Blue Cross firms, my guess is you say, eh, you know, they're like every other health insurance company, they deny my claims, um, et cetera. But, um, they have announced quite publicly that they are becoming a digital platform for health, and um, they also had announced that they're, you know, we're an AI-first company. So they're not there yet, but they're um, transitioning to, to do some of the things we're talking about today. Shell is doing some interesting work with other um, energy-oriented companies. There's a subsurface ecosystem. There's another one, um, 
a kind of an AI-oriented ecosystem with C3.ai. If you listen to NPR, you're very familiar with them. And um, uh, Baker Hughes, the energy technology firm, to try to um, exchange how we can analyze data effectively and so on. And then DBS Bank is the largest bank in Southeast Asia. Um, Dave Gledhill was CIO there, won the MIT CIO award a few years ago, and they have announced that they are um, they're big users of AI and are trying to do ecosystems. They count the number of APIs they have and really trying to build them up. If you're counting APIs, that's probably a good sign that you are uh, trying to move into one of these types of business models. Um, Ping An is really, I, I'm, I'm just finishing a book now on companies that are, quote, all in on AI, and Ping An is at the top of my list globally. Um, formed in the late 80s as a property and casualty insurance company, now in five different ecosystems, the largest private sector company in um, China. Um, they are not only in insurance, but also banking, healthcare, autos, and smart cities. They um, use AI for a lot of different things, some of which we probably wouldn't allow in the United States, like accessing whether you're good, uh, 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 assessing whether you're a good credit risk by having an AI system analyze your facial um, expression. Um, <laughs> I know it sounds wacky, but they seem to think it works. Um, I'll talk more about this one uh, um, medical um, intervention they have. They do a lot of personalized um, auto services, like helping you buy a car and so on. They automate all their client relationship stuff as much as possible. Tons and tons of, you know, technical and AI people, you can read that there, and they invest in companies as well. The good doctor system, you know, we hear about telemedicine in the United States. I think we're still incredibly primitive compared to this. You can decide. They have an AI system called Good Doctor that can diagnose and treat over 3,000 diseases, um, you know, remotely through your smartphone. Um, they have 1,800 medical professionals on staff who, if you do need to see a doctor, they can um, help you out. Or if you know, the doctor can see what the system has been telling you and say, well, you know, I'm not sure that's entirely correct. Let's pursue it a little further. Um, relationships with 110,000 pharmacies in case you need a drug, which can be automatically prescribed, 51,000 clinics and exam centers, and over 350 million patients. <laughs> That is a lot, I think, by any global standard. Um, they're also spreading into other parts of Southeast Asia, Indonesia, and I think um, Thailand is going to be next. But that tells you two things. One, these systems allow for very rapid growth. And two, there's a heck of a lot of people in China. <laughs> um, uh, but we don't have anything remotely resembling this in the, in the United States of America. 830,000 800, medical transactions a day. And every time I talk to Ping An, they say, oh, I'm sorry, we've got to bump those numbers up a bit. Still, still growing quite, quite rapidly. Um, so you too can do this if only you adopt a platform-based business model and throw some AI at it. <laughs> um, Marshall, tell me what I said wrong oh, there. There's nothing we can build on top. Let's see if we're not, um, r rather than correcting, let's see if we can build on top and extend a couple of the ideas. So um, what I want to do is perhaps give you two ideas beyond what Tom has already mentioned. So um, you know, the first of these is really just platforms and AI and, and uh, feedback loops. So one of the things I think Tom was mentioning earlier was these feedback loops, so like data, artificial, uh, sorry, artificial intelligence, APIs, and cloud. And there's this feedback loop where data is used to train your systems, which you then use to improve your products, which then increases the interaction and, get, and pulls customers in. So it's that kind of feedback loop that you can be trying to optimize over time. All these technologies are being used to create what I would call network effects in the sense that one interaction from one customer or one partner is being used to improve the quality of another interaction for an adjacent customer or adjacent partner. That's an externality. What's a network effect? Again, it's a product or service that becomes more valuable as more people use it. And that's the mechanism by which this happens. 
There's also, I want to give you two ideas uh, in the next five minutes, okay? One of these is the virtue of externalization. First of these is what happens when you're going it alone. So imagine this is the value added over time for just your own group. So there's value uh, on the vertical axis and time on the horizontal axis. If you get third parties in to help you out and you change your slope, what happens? Well, if you do that, you can start from a lower value proposition and, I don't know, does this thing have a pointer on it? Yeah, you start from lower value proposition and you have to overtake the leader because you're accumulating value at a faster pace. So you need third parties to come in. If you can change that slope, that's a really good thing. Now, take one step further. If you succeed in creating a feedback loop, so it's not just a one-time thing, then it's nonlinear. Then you can start from a very different proposition and then it's really hard to catch you. So the folks that actually engineer this in the right way to create these positive feedback loops create value accumulation at a higher pace. And again, it's your feedback, but it's also externalization. It's trying to get folks outside to help bring you ideas and help bring you additional value. When does data create value? There was a fun article that showed up in Harvard Business Review a uh, short while back. Here are a couple of quick properties, ways to think about your data and how that's going to bring you value. First is how much value is being added by the data as distinct from the product itself. So you're going to incur marginal costs on the physical products, zero marginal costs on the data. So how much value can you add through that? How fast does data-enabled learning diminish? Is it a diminishing marginal value add function, or are you going to be able to improve that over time? Or can you get that um, feedback to make it go convex? How fast does it depreciate? Is it something that's going to obsolesce very quickly, or is it going to be something that's going to endure over time? So you want to see if you can focus on durable information. And is it proprietary, or can it easily be copied? If it's easily be copied, then they can train their systems just as easily as yours, or they can acquire it someplace else. So it's another way uh, to get that data. Um, and then there's this last point that's especially important, again, driving network effects. How much does this data improve that same person's experience through time, or how much does it improve the experience of adjacent interactions or third parties, others? That's the real externality, that's the true benefit. So ask that question. So it's the same person over time or other people adjacent to that party. So that's how you're gonna even get value out of that data. Here's this, a quick fun example of Siemens, an industrial corporation using it. Fixed cost pricing gives you the red profit line. And when they used AI to train the systems, the mean profit increased about 10% steadily over time. So that's not static pricing, that's dynamic pricing. We're using AI to actually train their systems and actually improve the profitability uh, over time. Here's another fun example. Folks are constantly uploading pictures of their products. Which pictures are gonna help you sell more product? Well, this machine learning system actually has different photos of different rooms they do a little bit of color correction, and so that color correction increased uh, value by almost 500 annu annually. That color correction put over 500 annually. Or if there are pictures of different rooms, which ones are the best angles to get them to click through and rent the property? Well, those at the off angle are the ones that actually trained and provably have the best return on it. What's interesting is the machine learning systems pulled out mechanisms that are identified by artists and um, psychologists for actually improving consumer behavior. So you can train your systems on doing that. Just some fun examples uh, in this. Here's the second big idea I'd like to give you. Everyone now uses AI for recommender systems. Very straightforward idea. That, so that's not the idea. So what do you do with the recommender system? You know, Netflix originally used these to sell the stuff that didn't move on the long tail because it was competing with Blockbuster. Blockbuster had all of the home run movies and they had the leftover stuff that nobody wanted. So they built recommender systems to recommend a good match for inventory churn. So sure enough, you can do that, but a recommender system can become more than that. Here's what you need to do. Invert it and turn it into a design tool. So a recommender system takes existing products and tells you what will be successful. Instead, Use a recommender system to create products that don't yet exist to know what they will be for successful. So you can reverse it and invert it. So a wonderful example, I don't know how many of you ever watched House of Cards? That was originally green-lighted by an AI system rather than a bunch of human beings. That was an incredibly successful product. They also used it to design such things as Queen's Gambit, won 10 Golden Globes. Amazon's using their systems to design th such things as Marvelous Ms. Maisel. What's fun is Netflix won more 
than any other organization over half the possible TV awards. Now, are CBS, NBC able to do that? Use your systems as design tools, not just recommendation tools. So that's the other thing I wanted to give you. So to quickly give you a couple of uh, summaries on it, um, platforms always beat products. In any market where the two compete, platforms appreciate in value, whereas products depreciate in value. So they're always going to win. They're going to innovate faster if you actually get third parties to help. Network effects drive that growth. That's, again, because you get the value of one party's interactions increases the value of other parties' interactions, and that's where you get the positive feedback and the real uh, innovation. And you use AI and um, big data to drive exactly these things, and you lever these network effects and latent variables with these other models to make that happen. So those are the technologies. So again, the two ideas I really wanted to give you are one, capture external complements, not just yourself adding value, but third parties, and the other is use these systems as design tools, not just as matching tools. You've got the same technology, but you can use it in a completely novel way. Thank you. Um, Vipin, bring us back down to earth. When <laughs> I started talking to you about this subject, you said, uh, well, yeah, there are these external ecosystems, but there are also internal ecosystems that we, we need to pay attention to. Can you say a little bit about that? Correct, correct. So, uh, uh, Tom and, and Marshall, uh, thank you for that, um, I, I, you know, uh, the overview of, of this topic. Um, so, when I was talking to Tom about this, how does an organization get ready to really explore and exploit uh, ecosystems that uh, exist outside of their four walls. That's when uh, my thought came to me that the organization, there are, there are opportunities within large organizations to bring ecosystems uh, that are suboptimal, that are sitting in various parts of the organizations together so that we can start to capture the scale internally. So let's take the case of the pharmaceutical uh, industry, and that's not, uh, this is not an uh, example that is unique to my company. It's, it's um, something that we see across the industry where the, the various parts of the organization grew up in silos, uh, the research side, the, the clinical development side, the manufacturing and, and commercial. And there is a tremendous amount of data that is resident in various parts of the organization that are largely disconnected. So there is an opportunity to, to really even go beyond the four walls for within the companies, how do we create an ecosystem where data is flowing freely across the organization and then organizations are capturing the value of the data that they have in a seamless and, and expedient fashion. So you know, when I joined the organization about four years ago, one of the first things that I uh, championed was to create that uh, ecosystem across the enterprise where data is managed consistently and with, with consistent policies and, and procedures and security guidelines and so on and so forth, which we call the enterprise data program, which, which is really uh, fundamental to what we do across the enterprise, uh, you know, all the way from drug discovery uh, to clinical development and getting the drugs into the hands of the patient. So I do think there is a, there is a necessary and fundamental step that organizations need to take first internally to be prepared to uh, leverage external ecosystems to create even more value. I don't know, that sounds like hard work to me, Vipin. <laughs> it is. <laughs> slog, a hard slog, as yes. they say, heavy lift. Um, so Michelle, your business is almost an ecosystem business by definition, right? Um, you're, you're working with all these, you know, Lilly and a variety of other pharmaceutical firms to, to do clinical trials on their drugs. How, how does your internal ecosystem affect your external ecosystem? So uh, first, let me start by saying we're in a similar place as Lily in terms of even just trying to get our own internal data interoperable, right, and, yes. and working together and to break down those silos. And I would say it's, it's thankless work. Um, <laughs> it's, uh, you know, it's like that cartoon, who wants clean data? Everyone puts their hand up. Who wants to clean the data? Everyone's looking at their shoes, right? So, um, but anyways, but we, in the, in the same way, we had to uh, create capability with our own data before we could even augment it and work it through a true ecosystem, right? But it's a little different for us as a service provider. And uh, it's different because um, the data that we develop around an asset, a Lilly asset, a lupus asset, let's use that example, 
um, goes with the product back to Lilly. So we're only temporary stewards of that data. And what we had to realize is that the data that we formed as a byproduct of executing that research as you know, how to execute it, what countries to run the protocols in, how many patients you would need, um, we had to value it as an asset first and realize um, that it could be used to design the next lupus study better than the one. So to your, you know, Marshall, to your, your product enhancement, use your, your recommender tool to inform design as an industry in life science um, in the better in improving the treatment of patients. We've got to do that too, right? The next protocols have to be more effective than the current. Um, but um, also as a service provider, the nature of uh, the way our business operates and our business model does dictate the investments we can make. And so very naturally, we depend on others, best in class uh, data suppliers, healthcare data suppliers, best in class AI companies, external platforms, right? So, so from out of the gate, we had to build an ecosystem to navigate. And some of that external data is that sort of real world evidence yep. that you're trying yep. to supply uh, some services around as well? Right, right. So, are you guys talking with AI at all? Um, uh, I don't, you hadn't met yeah. before, so maybe <laughs> not that much. Huh? Um, you know, if you look at the, um, let's take the, the life sciences industry, um, you know, what are, we, what are we really essentially trying to do and, and trying to do better? Um, you know, if you look at the metrics for the, the pharma industry, it takes about 10 years, roughly 10 years, to get a drug from discovery to the market. It takes about two and a half billion dollars to do that. Um, and if you look at the number of drugs that are getting into phase one, only 12% actually get it into the, uh, eventually get into the, into the market. And this is, these are industry metrics. So what that means is that 88% of the drugs who are getting into phase one doesn't make it. Uh, it, it. You know, there is an opportunity, the way I sort of think about this in terms of the overall ecosystem that uh, Tom and Marshall uh, brilliantly articulated is when the entities that are involved in this overall ecosystem uh, can come together and really leverage that ecosystem to say, hey, how can we get a drug into the hands of the patients in much less than 10 years in a cost uh, that is much lower than two and a half billion dollars and at a success rate that is much higher than 12%. I think that's the holy grail um, in our industry. And of course, partners uh, like, uh, you know, like uh, Michelle and her organization really enabling the, um, the, 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 the data and the, and the digital uh, information that we have uh, to bring that together so that we can collectively, uh, uh, collectively um, uh, attack these challenges and the opportunities that we have. So I'll give an example. The longest time frame in the overall, you know, taking a drug from discovery to the market is spent in clinical trials. We all learned about, uh, you know, the importance of doing clinical trials uh, faster during COVID. And, and, you know, when do the fin clinical trials finish? And, you know, when can we get the drug uh, available and so on and so forth? And there are ways to really understand what is going on in the clinical trials and design it in such a fashion when we have this collective ecosystem available to us. You know, how do we select sites that can execute on the clinical trials faster? Um, how do we make sure that the things that, um, you know, stop and then restart uh, uh, trials like protocol amendments uh, are addressed way ahead of time? Uh, we can predict these things uh, could, could happen. Um, and, and so on and so forth. So I think the opportunity uh, with many partners in this ecosystem uh, is huge uh, when we are bringing that whole um, ecosystem together and apply AI to it. And I think, uh, you know, I may be biased uh, within my industry, but I do believe that AI will offer tremendous potential to address some of the challenges and opportunities that we have as an industry, like the metrics that uh, I talked about uh, earlier. Michelle, are you similarly bullish? I am very bullish. So um, just to bring it to a very practical example, to do my job, you guys. <laughs> um, so uh, today in clinical development, in clinical trials, we will do a study, a protocol is designed, it answers, a safety, uh, answers uh, maybe a couple of safety and efficacy questions about that compound being studied. If we can augment that, in, Historically, in traditional clinical development, 
that result would be combined with the results of other protocols, um, and that would be the form the submission to the regulatory authorities in which they would base a you know, decision to approve the drug to go to market or not. Well, today, if you take that one study and you augment it with other real-world data, other EMR data, other claims data, other data on that patient, you can reuse that asset and answer many more questions in a compressed time frame than the single study, single question model, right? And that's what will yes. reduce our overall clinical development timelines and cost. You can't do that without AI. And then not to mention, you know, we have issues where drugs um, that appear safe and efficacious in a, a controlled clinical trial setting get into the market and when they're co-prescribed with other uh, drugs or there's other uh, you know, health factors in play, they turn out not to be safe. So we have an opportunity to augment data sets and use AI to do signal detection or pattern detection around safety and understand maybe the relationship of genotype to a certain type of side effect, et cetera, in a way we don't today. Mm -hmm. So Tom, if I interject and connect two things that they've said that are actually quite interesting. So I want to connect uh, something that when you said also on the reuse. We did a study of over 200 firms that actually adopted APIs, what happened to their productivity, their cost structure, their revenues, their market cap. Those that were able to reuse and starting inside, mm -hmm. they started inside with the more successful ones. Um, so they, uh, those that did that actually had a good and steady increase in value. Those that didn't do that actually lost market share in value. But the ones that actually then went to the th last step of externalizing so third parties could reuse saw a 4% gain in market cap over two years and 38% over 16 years. So it was a huge gain in modularization, externalization, and reuse, starting inside and then going outside. One you created company. an API stock index that we can invest <laughs> in these companies that use a lot of APIs? I actually think the cloud companies could do this and uh, make tons of money, yes. Because you're, you're literally seeing the lifeblood of the, the digits transfer back and forth across the, of the ecosystem. You could absolutely do that. So you, you heard this opportunity here today. <laughs> Give us 10% of whatever you make if you, if you pull this off. But. Go ahead, go ahead, you were saying something else, I interrupted you. There, there's one tiny caveat. So when you externalize the APIs uh, that you don't face when you go internally alone, there's a 1.2% chance of getting hacked each month. So uh, unsurprisingly, so you're gonna get the huge gains, but it comes with something you have to manage. So you have to manage the security risks in addition. But start modularization inside, then externalize it to really get third party value creation, and that's when it, the market cap really takes off. So are either of you um, starting to hear things around, you know, I talked to one of Michelle's um, uh, colleagues, um, I think reports to you ultimately or something like that, um, who was saying, oh, you know, we're, I'm studying this for a class and uh, we could create this sort of AI-based platform and so on. Are senior executives starting to say, we should be doing this in your organizations? Or are they kind of looking out at the outside world and saying, gee, those platform business models make a lot more money than we do. Um, should we drift in, in that direction? Yeah, um, it's definitely a focus. We're looking at AI in really three buckets at Paracel. There's the RPA, you know, automation, um, there's the and pattern. That's a, that's a short term payoff, yep. right? Yeah. Yep. Especially as a service provider, when your labor is your revenue, right? You've got to be building efficiency constantly. Um, but the second is um, pattern detection, so risk signal detection, not just in the safety data example that I was using, but um, you know, we have a responsibility to detect fraudulent activity that might be going on in a study and take action at sites if we feel that they're not complying with the protocol. Those are all, uh, those data types all lend themselves to that sort of risk pattern and, you know, directed action uh, to, mitigate, uh, to mitigate the risk. Then the third thing is predictive outcomes. So um, Vipin's more, you know, it deals with discovery. We don't. We deal with ClinDev purely. But, um, but, you know, if we can use AI to help us look across heterogeneous 
uh, population data and try to understand uh, which patients might respond differently to you know, different protocol designs, different therapeutic interventions, then we'll do a much better job uh, directing the study to the patients who need to participate. Um, so those are the three big buckets. Uh, as a, we're committed to you know, being a clinical development company, so would we productize the platforms? Probably not. We'd probably use them to really enhance the service provision. Sure. Um, so Vipin, I, I was telling Vipin earlier that I'd done some research, I don't know, almost 20 years ago about innovation sourcing. And this was in the era where people were starting to say, oh, you should do move to crowdsourcing. Don't rely on that tired old R&D organization. <laughs> you know, get uh, people out in the world at large to do your innovation for you. Um, anyway, we talked to a number of companies about their approaches to innovation sourcing. And at the time, Lilly, which did some crowdsourcing as well, there was this interesting business called Innocentive that Lilly started, ended up being based in the Boston area. But Lilly was the most sophisticated in terms of innovation sourcing of all the companies we came across. Um, given that you've been doing this for a while, Vip, and now you'd think people would start saying, well, the, these companies that we invest in, buy molecules from, partner with, et cetera, we should be using AI to pick some of those things. Is, is anybody saying that yet? Well, um, I, I mean, you know, when we think you about can say it. no, <laughs> not even close, Devin. Um, you know, when, when we think about the use of um, AI, I, th I think we are uh, thinking, you know, really broadly, right? So, so um, yes, in the R&D space for, you know, how do we enable model-driven drug discovery, right? And, and uh, you know, there is tremendous amounts of data that a company like Lilly has uh, from previous uh, uh, drug discovery efforts, uh, experiences from previous clinical trials. How do we use that data with the potential and, uh, and power that is enabled by AI for rapid drug discovery, right? So drug discovery is a game of uh, in a rapidly narrowing funnel. So you start from uh, huge possibilities and then you, then you narrow down. And that, that process of narrowing down really enables us to get to the uh, uh, molecules much faster. Um, and, and again, Tom, to, to the earlier point, um, uh, the use of AI is, is, is an organizational change management um, effort as well. And, and industries like ours, and very successfully innovated um, in, 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 in the past. And now we are thinking about a new way of innovation through AI and the digital ecosystems that are available to us. And how do we generate proof points of success with that innovation that will buy uh, further uh, adoption within the organization? And, and that's, that's, that's a journey. And I do think um, you know, some of the work that we've been uh, doing in the clinical trial space and the, the potential of uh, discovering new drugs, uh, et cetera, et cetera, have generated that, that momentum. And uh, um, you know, I only see that momentum um, increasing o over time. Yeah. So somebody said this morning in one of the earlier panels that culture is their operating system and I wonder if either of you, or Marshall, you may know some companies doing this as well, are trying to create a different culture that would enable more of this to happen if the hard work of getting your data in shape wasn't enough. Are you changing the culture as well? Or? Um, I know Bippin's uh, trying. <laughs> you know, I, I do think as a chief data officer, um, enabling a data-driven culture is one of my primary jobs. Um, and uh, you know, historically, chief data officers have looked at building the data infrastructure, AI models, et cetera, et cetera. Those are all important, have to be done. But I think having an intentional effort to drive cultural change has to be an important part of the job of a CDO. And how do you do that? Uh, you do that through intentional ways of developing programs, uh, generating early uh, quick wins. Um, you know, one of the things that, that, uh, that we are doing at Lilly is, uh, is the creation of what we call the Lilly Data and Analytics Institute. Uh, we, we did that uh, you know, a couple of years ago. And the goal that we have is to upskill uh, the entire workforce of 30,000 people in some fashion or the other in data and analytics. Um, it's not a game of the data scientists anymore. 
it, it, is, it is a game of really getting the organization as a whole uh, to be culturally evolving, to be performing in an AI-enabled ecosystem. And, um, and, and that has been a, and a fabulous uh, journey for us. Um, and if we don't do that, I think the adoption is going to be uh, less than what it will be. And the other point I would like to make about the culture is, is what does a digital ecosystem do within the organization? Digital ecosystems that are connected really breaks down organizational silos. The previous silos, you know, they had their own data, they do their own things, they don't necessarily talk to the other silos, but digital ecosystems rapidly break down silos. And the organization culture changes because of that. Um, so upskilling, making data available, et cetera, et cetera, I do think are extremely important um, things to be doing in addition to building the assets. Let me go next. I'm happy to go turn it over. <laughs> so um, I think Vipin touched on the value creation. So we're 20,000 people in about 78 countries, I think, right now. And I would tell you everybody's either a data generator, or data consumer, or both in our company. Um, and the cultural shift is essential. And it's, um, you know, it is a test of stamina. Um, and if you don't return value to the data originators, you can't get that first time data quality, you can't get data moving to your enterprise information model the way it should. The silos that Vipin talked about where I think about my clinical trial management system or I think about my HR management system in my own vertical, um, it, it's in, therefore these data I create are from my own reporting needs and I don't appreciate that other people consume these data f downstream from me. Um, it, it's just, uh, it's, it's brutal to get the change. People fall back to their old way of working, you know, just very human, basic human behavior. So um, figuring out which sorts of analytics programs you can accelerate to create value for them and get them bought into, you know, sustained change behaviors uh, is, is really critical, I would say. So there was a fun summary. I wish I could remember which CEO said this, but he, he had a really nice summary of uh, some of the changes which were, if we have data to make decisions, then let's use data. If all we have is opinions, then let's use mine. <laughs> right? Um, and he said that for a couple of reasons. The most important was, of course, he's really trying to get the, decision, the organization to do A-B testing, to stop using opinions and actually use facts. Uh, and you really get better decisions when you do use facts. And there's great empirical research that says that organizations that do it are more successful. One thing that's interesting is that you need to be willing in some sense to relinquish control and let the data speak. Um, you, know, really, you need to be able to explore and see what comes out of that and be willing to challenge your own assumptions when you do that. Um, you know, I have a friend also, Michael Schrag, who points out that you shouldn't be just using the data to answer questions. You should also be using the data to ask questions and look for things that you hadn't thought about. It's another nice way of thinking about that data overall. On that point, um, you have to be able to trust the data, though, right? And so, it's true. One it's of the, true. the challenges that we have with the siloed structure and trying to break that down in the siloed systems is that you have multiple sources of uh, service data, study design data, et cetera. Um, and trying to lasso the reporting so that we consolidate it down to you know the system of record these are very basic principles right but very hard in practice so that people begin to focus on that source of data that quality and therefore trust it um, because we are very much in a space right now very you know very common issue for us week over week is I see this result on headcount I see this result on headcount I don't trust the data I'm shocked, simply shocked, that that would happen in your organization, Michelle. Yeah, show, so. yeah. <laughs> Finance versus operations, yeah. like everywhere, right? So there's a, a question on Slido. Um, I suppose it's an appropriate question to address here in the maybe the world center of personalized um, medicine, uh, Kendall Square. Um, uh, do you see AI helping to create these individualized drugs that are specifically created for a person based on their their genome, their various omics, their um, 
the drugs they're already taking, their uh, metabolism, et cetera. Um, and I guess mostly to the, to the point of this panel, what does that mean in terms of new participants in the ecosystem and uh, whose AI is going to drive that and, and so on? It's essential. So it's, you know, we're such, a com we're such complex organisms, right? There's no way that our human brains are going to see all the variables that come together that make you respond to treatment A and me respond to B. Um, but the challenge, the new entrance in the ecosystem, I think, is going to be getting that AI operating at the point of care. So we can, VIP and Lily can manufacture the compounds and get them out there, but to match them to the patient, it has to be deployed at the point of care. Yeah, what, isn't there some data suggesting that um, the great majority of oncologists don't really understand how to use the personalized cancer medicines that we have today, um, that they, um, I don't know, I've, I've heard some really sophisticated oncologists, academic ones say, the understanding just isn't out there. And in fact, we need AI to help explain, you need to put this patient on this trial or this drug or whatever based on their various omics that we have, have data on. Yeah, so, so um, we see personalization happening in many industries, right? So, you know, when you, when you sort of think about that and map that into the healthcare domain, um, the concepts are similar. I think the, uh, the complexities of personalization is orders of magnitude more. Um, you know, I think the, the, the eventual, um, it will take a long time, but there is no reason to believe that will not happen. Because the power of AI is precisely what Michelle just, just mentioned. Uh, I think what, uh, this is probably beyond the capacity of a single human mind, uh, you know, the complexity of what needs to be understood to really personalize Care overall, when you sort of say personalized care, it includes a variety of things, you know, medicines and, 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 and treatment and so on and so forth. But given that personalization is here to stay in many industries, you know, I am again bullish on the fact that personalized care will be available in healthcare in many dimensions. And we will conquer that complexity with, with AI over, I would say, a longer period of time. It's not going to happen tomorrow. It may be happening in uh, pockets uh, today and tomorrow, but over a longer period of time, that personalized care will, will happen, uh, and that's my strong uh, belief. Marshall, do you have any feeling about what other industries are going to be seeing this happen quickly? Do you get calls from... So people in the steel industry saying, you know, make me a platform. That sort well, of thing. So that's a, that's a fun question. So um, we shouldn't assume that every industry is going to transform to become a platform industry. Uh, a simple way to think about this, and it's a useful test, is to ask how easy is it to invert the firm? And by that I mean how easy is it for third parties to create and add value on your behalf? If you're only doing the value creation yourself, then you're not going to create an ecosystem. You need third parties to come in and add value. So several simple tests are one, we mentioned, what's the proportion of value added by information versus just the standalone product? Because it's really easy to spread value from person to person to person or add others. So what's the proportion of value created by information? It's much easier to create platforms and ecosystems around that. Second, picking up on an earlier point that you said, is modularity, reuse. The more modular and reusable components are, the more easily third parties can adapt them and build upon them, a set of Lego building blocks, if you will. One that's missed in healthcare is risk. The riskier it is, the harder it is to build an external. You don't want third parties, you don't open APIs on pacemakers because you'll kill people, right? You don't open APIs in nuclear power plants, Russia and terrorists will get in there. So if it's risky, you don't want third parties in there. So you have to internalize that risk. And the last one is actually an interesting one. To what extent is there spare capacity? If there is, you can time slice it and marketize it. Uh, you know, an MRI machine might get 40% usage, so you could actually then time slice it and then rent it to others. So those are easy ways to do it. So those 
are simple tests to determine how easily can third parties add value, and if so, then absolutely the market will transform to a platform, and you should be running full steam ahead. There are a couple of related questions, I think, for our life sciences friends here. Um, uh, one is, how do you um, test AI systems to make sure that they work as expected? And then another question saying, being in a highly regulated environment, how does it change how you manage and govern the life cycle for your AI models? One aspect of which is ensuring they are working as expected. Uh, are you engaging a lot yet with regulators about um, AI uh, in, your, in your business? Um, I, I would say, I mean, you know, when, you, when you think about uh, FDA, uh, you know, uh, there have been many um, uh, 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 products that has been approved by the FDA um, uh, Software-based medical devices. I yes, think medical devices and, yeah. and, and, and so on and so forth. So across many therapeutic areas. Uh, so there is progress in that space. And, you know, uh, regulators, again, uh, they are trying to do what they're intent, uh, you know, protect the patients, making sure the products that are put out there are safe, et cetera, et cetera. And so it's natural the regulatory framework will, will lag the innovation that is happening in the space, and it'll, it'll, it takes some time for that to uh, catch up. Um, uh, but again, you know, I, I think um, uh, the regulatory framework will evolve to manage and govern the AI systems that are being put in place. And, and our regulators, I, I think there is a lot of work that's going on to put frameworks around um, you know, AI models and, 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 and devices with algorithms embedded in them and, and so on and so forth. But I think innovation has to happen and really show the possibilities. Uh, and, and of course, and the regulation will, will catch up um, and uh, we should not expect it to happen the other way. Um, so, so uh, that, you know, one of the reasons, I mean, for regulator industries, uh, the adoption of AI and so on and so forth, is slower is the fact that you know, we need to have those guidelines in place. We need to have those frameworks to protect the patients in place. And that's, that's fine, that's fine. Um, but let's, let's continue to innovate. So uh, three things come to mind. Um, one is the consumer space moves faster than our regulated space for very good reason. Um, and so if we're mindful and we watch what's happening there and how those AI algorithms are performing based on design, what's trusted, what's not, we can, um, I think, pull those principles over into our regulated environment. Um, the second thing is, you know, there is a long history of uh, data integrity, data quality, data control built into the clinical development process just so that we can trust that the decisions we make around the safety and efficacy of a compound or a, or a device um, are substantiated. And those principles have to be lifted and shifted into this environment. When the data is coming from other places, if we're pulling data directly from a healthcare system, um, if we're augmenting data, um, we have to understand the chain of custody. We have to know the context of it and how it was gathered. What was the standard of care in play when that data was sourced? Does it apply to my, my protocol? Um, you know, it, what's the change controls around the data? Is there a traceability matrix? All those things exist with the way that we handle data together uh, today, I'm sorry, in a traditional um, architected controlled environment, um, it, but they, it has to work in a more open environment. Um, and then the last bit about the, you know, how do you know, you know, if your AI is working the way that it's meant to, you know, it's your training data sets. You know, maybe if I was a consumer company, I could let my training data set go and there would be no harm, but I need to hold on to it, uh, you know, in, in life science and continue to go back to it and validate it and make sure that, you know, it's, it's sound, it's applicable. Plus, I guess we'll, we'll have to have sort of ML ops system for this that ultimately yeah. detect whether drift is taking yeah. place, so we need to retrain, retrain that model, right? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, Marshall, you, I know, have done some interesting research on how different countries approach the regulation of data and algorithms and so on. Do you, uh, do you think any of that confer 
ecosystem advantages or disadvantages? Oh, wow, yes. I mean, you yourself had in your first example, Ping An is using facial recognition for credit scoring. That would not fly in the United States. Um, no, that's a very interesting uh, case. Um, the Europeans are far more privacy protective than the Americans, who are more privacy protective than the Chinese. Um, you know, so it's quite interesting. Uh, there's a really wonderful book by Kai-Fu Lee on AI superpowers. And one of his arguments is that uh, not only is it because it's a massively large population, because there's so much data available in the systems, and because there's so little privacy, AI is going to be trained faster, better, cheaper there than any place else. So expect to see really tough competition coming out of China, um, precisely because of different regulatory laws on that. Let me give you one further thought on it, though, and this will be one, um, just as going forward, what I expect you should anticipate, but also how you might design it into your systems. So in Europe, they've given us GDPR, General Data Privacy Regulation, that thought was that you, by giving everyone control of their own data, they would empower you to negotiate and claim some of that value back. All the evidence suggests didn't work. The reason is you created islands of friction in negotiation. None of us have time to negotiate with every single company on every single transaction. It's just not worth it. Um, when they did that, the ad effectiveness fell. The venture capital investment in European startups fell. Um, and the number of apps in the app stores fell because they were no longer compliant. So it was in some ways damaging. For what it's worth, we proposed a new data right to solve that problem call it an in situ data right. The idea is you bring the algorithm to your data where it resides as opposed to yanking the data from the infrastructure. This solves all different kinds of problems. So it never goes stale because it's always current. It doesn't lose potency because you can now use it to make a purchase or make a post or receive a benefit. Um, and it's more secure because if, if someone behaves badly, you just turn off their API access. You don't have to worry if they destroy the data. They never had it. You still have it. And last of all, it's really nice, because you're the bottleneck, everyone who's trying to gain access to your data is going to have to negotiate with you, so they give you more power, they give you more benefit. Those are the good news. Summary of that one is the Europeans, I believe, have accepted our proposal and are introducing the next generation of the Digital Markets Act. Um, we have not yet been able to introduce it into the United States legislation, but we're working on it. So this is a thought. Uh, for how things should be working, and maybe you'll see this in a data rights package near you shortly. So, Marshall, what are you doing here? You should be in Davos talking about this. <laughs> <laughs> um, We're, we've been working on platforms and how you get value from data for a long time. This was a, we thought we could design some new data rights to make this helpful. Yeah, it's great. Um, we only have a couple of minutes left, so maybe any um, quick comments from any of you about how you think your companies, these companies should deal with AI, particularly with regard to ecosystems. I'll just say one thing. My research has suggested to me that you really need to think about AI as an enabler of business change, an enabler of new business models like these ecosystems and platforms. Don't just use it to cut costs, make existing decisions a little bit better. Michelle? I think I would go with um the iterative cycle on your process. So don't drop the technology on the existing way of working. Let it evolve the way that your, your business operates truly. Um, I, I would say you know, organizations need to think about the possibilities of, uh, of AI and think about them strongly. Um, it, you know, one of the things that is actually happening with the, the digital ecosystem is that the gaps, the gap between industries and uh, industrial domains is actually narrowing, right? So I do believe um, one of the biggest disruptors for barrier to entry to any industry is going to be the digital ecosystems that are present. So, you know, thinking about the potential of you know, newer things in adjacent industries and even in your space uh, through the possibilities of AI is an important consideration for the future. So I would add one thought for you. Every technology, not just AI, every single technology is a double-edged sword. There's some incredible potential, some great opportunity that can be done with it, but you should always ask, how could it be misused? 
what's going to happen with it. To give you a simple example, Google has these wonderful technologies that actually let you know is a restaurant busy or not, or the streets clogged or not. Well, guess what? They disabled all of that in Ukraine recently because they didn't want the Bush Russians bombing high-density populations because that's a misuse of the technology. AI is going to have that set of issues in spades. So absolutely think of the best possible uses, but think of the misuses and see if you can mitigate those and anticipate them. Uh, I'm sorry, we're out of time. <laughs> I, I, was, I was instructed to have all the questions be on Slido. Sorry about that. Um, thank you all for coming. Thanks very much to our panel participants for um, enlightening us today, and hope you enjoy the, the rest of the conference. Thanks, Tom. Thank you. Thank you.